exactly. Uh, one second. Um, is anyone having problems with me breaking up? My voice breaking up? I'm going to try to fix my uh, settings. Give me a second. Uh, okay, let's see. If you have a problem with the either the video or the audio or during when I'm sharing my screen, just let me know. Okay. So one of the first things you're going to notice is that some of the things were go, uh, that in your book is in chapter eight, we have already covered in the previous two lectures, although we were naming it chapter seven. So that is something to bear in mind. Um, okay, we finished this. I'm just bringing up the slides on the screen now. Okay. Share entire screen. Okay. Okay. So potential energy and conservation of energy is the title of this chapter. So as a conclusion, in the previous chapter, we said or we sent that well, we said that W equals delta K. The work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. In this chapter, we are going to slightly expand on this idea, and we will see that it's not only equal to the change in kinetic energy, there are other types of energy as well. But let's start with this simple view, W equals delta K. Now, if energy is positive, we gain it. If energy is negative, if work is, is negative, we lose energy, okay? What types of energy did we look at so far? We looked at energy related to movement. We looked at energy related to gravity. We looked at energy related to springs. Okay. And what we could, we give some of them names. Those that the, the energy that is to do with the bodies rubbing against, against each other, we said it's friction. Energy related to movement, we called it kinetic energy. And energy related to gravity, we called it gravitational potential energy. That of the spring, we called it elastic potential energy. Okay. We also said energy could be lost due to friction, and we called that thermal energy or heat energy or just friction. Okay. Now let's consider a bungee jumper. Okay, someone who goes into a helicopter is crazy enough or brave enough, depending on your point of view, to attach him or herself to a rope and then jump. And what happens is this person jumps out of the helicopter and then at the very end, because the rope is shorter than the fall distance, he'll just stop and it goes back up and down, up and down again, very much like you do with Chai Lipton. Now, <clears throat> The new concept is we're introducing today is called potential energy, and we are denoting it with the letter U. It is energy that can be associated with the position of an object in the system that exert forces on one another. So the key terms here is depending on position and exert forces on one another. What does this mean? A system of objects may be something like Earth and a bungee jumper. 
Bungie Jumper is a tiny, tiny human. Earth is huge, but it's still a system because Earth exerts gravity on the jumper. <laughs> okay. Now, this is what bungee jumping looks like. Okay, and this is what it looks like at the very end. You fall and eventually the rope stops you from falling further. <coughs> so, we already called the work done by gravity <coughs> mg dot d. Yes, because we said work equals f dot d. F is mg, so mg dot t, and we said it would be mg d cosine theta, where d is the distance moved. <clears throat> okay, so we are all the, also <clears throat> we looked at the example of uh, the rock, and we said positive work is done by the gravitational force when it's falling down, and negative work is done by the gravitational force when it's going up. So to reiterate what we already said, for an object being raised or lowered, the energy that is used or expended in raising it or lowering it <clears throat> goes, which is also what we call work, goes into gravitational potential energy. If you remember, we said, OK, what if a rock starts from scratch at rest, u equals 0 goes up and then here it again stops so v is also equal to zero we said the work done to lift it against gravity okay is equal to potential energy which we at the time called mgh gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh yes right <clears throat> okay so let's see if we have we can recap everything we have said so far in the previous lectures. An apple of mass 100 grams is raised through a vertical distance of one meter. What is the work done by gravity on the apple and what is the change in its potential energy delta u? So which one? I'll go back up for you to see this. On the way up, the work is negative because the degree is 180. On the way down, it is positive. We have E's, we have B's, we have C's. Lots of C's. Good. The correct answer is indeed C. Why? On the way up, your energy goes M, G, H cosine theta, <clears throat> 0 0.1 kilograms times 9.81 times 1 cosine 180 degrees. And this is equal to minus 0 0.98 joules. Sorry, this is work, not potential energy. Uh, your potential energy is equal. You can either say simply MGH or you can say it is the net change. Initially, it was zero. And sorry. Yes, initially it was zero. And finally, it was 98, 0 0.98. So you end up with 0 0.98 joules.
180. This is supposed to be 180. Okay. All right, good. Now, there's a very interesting thing that happens here, which many of us haven't really noticed or considered before. The work done, or otherwise we say the change in potential energy is actually independent of the path chosen. Okay, it's, it doesn't matter what path we take. Okay, by moving straight up, if I take this box and I go straight up, what is its potential, uh, the work done going to be? Mg d cosine 180, which is the same as minus mgs, or if I just call this height h, because it's easier, it's just minus mgh, right? What if I take it up to the same height, but over an inclined plane? So rather than just going straight up, I go up over this line. What's the work I am going to be doing at that time? It's still f dot b, so mgs cosine alpha, okay, or cosine theta. So the, remember, it's the angle between the force and the direction of movement, so this entire thing. Okay. And I will end up <clears throat> with mgs2 90, cosine 90 plus whatever angle is there. And I end up with M, G, H again. Okay. Now this is very interesting and has a lot of important applications because the change in potential energy only depends on the vertical height with respect to a reference level. And I'll explain what a reference level is in a second. Okay. So theoretically speaking, okay, in physics, I can go using this road, I can go using this road, or I can go using this road. Okay, my, fine, my, my change in potential energy is still going to only be M, G, H. Why higher than 90? Because this is the direction of movement. This is the direction of the force. This is already 90 degrees and this is theta. So 90 plus theta equals alpha. Why sine not cosine? No, it's still cosine. It's, it's cosine alpha. Cosine alpha is the same as, and alpha is what? Alpha is 90 plus theta. What's cosine 90 plus theta? It's the same as sine theta. If you remember from school, your sine looks like this. And your cosine looks like this. Uh, did this wrong. Uh, still wrong. You're out of phase by pi over four. Yeah. So cosine pi over two plus theta is equal to sine. Now, what do we call this when it doesn't matter what path we take, the result is still the same. 
if the work done by a force in a system is independent of the path taken, which means not dependent, independent, then the force is called a conservative force. Okay? So remember this, conservative force means it doesn't matter what path you take, the result is still going to be the same. So if I go from A to B, my work is going to be minus the change in potential energy. So my final potential energy at B minus my initial potential energy at, U, at A. On the way back, it's going to be exactly the opposite, although it's not the same road. Yeah, it did not come back like this. No, it came back from a different road. But since it came back from B to A, the work of return is going to be minus the initial work done to go up, which means the net work is going to be equal to zero. So conservative forces are forces for which Going one way, the work is equal to minus coming in reverse. Okay. Now, initial and final potentials do not need to be the same. Okay, at A and B. But here it is UA. Here it is UB. And if you go from A to B to A, then your U initial is going to be UA and your U final is going to be UA, so your delta U is going to be zero. Let's consider this. We have a figure that shows, that, that shows three paths from A to B. Path A goes like this, path B goes like this, and you have a third path that goes back. The same force F does the indicated work on a particle moving along each path. Is F conservative or not? So your work one is equal to this, work two is equal to this, work three is equal to this. Is it conservative or not? Okay, quite a few answers. A's, B's, C's, most of you say C, a couple of B's and a single A. So the correct answer is B, not conservative. Why? What was our rule for conservative forces? Going from A to B, no matter what path it takes, it's the same work, right? This road takes minus 60 joules going from A to B. This road going from A to B takes plus 60 joules. So there's a difference of 120 joules between them. Yes? So, they're not the same. They're going from the same place to the same place, but we get two different numbers. So immediately, the answer is no. 
Now, many of you did the common mistake of saying yes, but only for the two paths with 60 joule work. Here's the thing. A force is either conservative or non-conservative. It cannot be conservative for only special cases, at least at this level. Okay, it cannot be conservative for only some paths, but not other paths, because then it's not conservative anymore. Okay, you cannot trust that no matter what path I take, I'm going to end up with the same result. Also, this path is going to the in the opposite way. So if it was conservative, if say, for example, I did not have this. Okay, we only have these two paths. These numbers would still mean it is not conservative. One of them would need to be negative for it to be conservative. Because remember, we said going back, the change should be zero. OK. Let's give examples of conservative forces. Gra gravitational force is conservative. The spring force is conservative. Then we say, okay, what then are non-conservative forces? How do we know them? Non-conservative forces are those for which going forward is not equal to minus going backward. Okay. So this is non-conservative and this is conservative. Conservative. You go back, you go forward, you have W, you come back, you have minus W. This is conservative. Non-conservative, you do not get this behavior. You get some other thing. Okay. What are examples of non-conservative forces? Friction. Friction is one example of non-conservative forces. Okay. Let me erase these so that the slide would actually be clear. Okay. Now, what happens in friction is you have kinetic energy due to movement. And due to friction, it becomes heat. Right? Let me ask you a question. If I take a rock and take it up to this position. I spend some energy doing so, right? Now, when I leave the rock, what happens? It goes back down again, and its energy at this point, right before it reaches, its energy here is equal it's energy here. So basically, I am getting my energy back. But can I say the same thing for friction? I have an object. It is moving, and there is friction going. It started moving at 10 meters per second. Due to friction, it went down to 5 meters per second. If now I bring this back, so it was going this way, and I bring it back. OK, can I get my energy back? OK, one person says yes. One person says no. OK, think about it. If you are. But does this happen in reality? If something slows down due to friction and you start bringing it backwards, do you get your energy back? No. What you do is you spend even more energy to take it back. So you lose two energies. OK, so thermal energy is lost as heat and it cannot be put back into kinetic energy again. OK, at least not via the friction force. Yes, you can speed up your object again. But you're going to be giving it extra energy using your hand or the gas pedal in the car or something. So friction, which did minus kinetic minus energy, you cannot do positive energy with kinetic energy with 
friction. So thermal energy is not a potential energy. Friction is not conservative. Whether it's static friction or kinetic friction. Well, static, actually, yes, even static friction. Yeah, because imagine if you're pushing something and it's not moving. You're doing stuff, energy to make it move, but there's no work being done, actually. Let's take a look at this problem. It's interesting. Equivalent paths for calculating work. Slippery cheese. You have a block of cheese on a slippery surface, and it's going to go down this path and end up here at point B. And we want to know, and, and it has a vertical distance between A and B. So this distance is equal to 0 0.8 meters. How much work is done by gravity on cheese? Now, one way to do it is I could simply do work is equal to MGD cosine 90 for the x-axis for horizontal and vertically MGD cosine 0, just put in MGH, M is 2 kilograms, this is G, this is height, and I get 15.7 joules. Very, very easy. Another option I can do is I can say, no, I am going to find the mathematical function of this curve. And I am going to do the integral over this path of my force over my path. Now, which one is easier, you tell me? Is simply saying MGH easier or is doing an integration easier? M M MGH is way easier, isn't it? And this is one of the beautiful thing about having conservative forces is that it doesn't matter what path you take, you will get the same answer. Yeah, so you can choose the easiest path. You can look for the easy path and just do it. Yeah. Instead of doing finding the mathematical formula and integrating and 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 just do the path done. Okay. So how do I determine my potential energy value? Okay, let me just do something. How do I determine my potential energy values? Believe it or not, okay, not only students run away from integration, pretty much no one likes integration, okay? Even career established physicists, if you give them a choice, I'm, I can solve a problem using integration or without using integration. They are going to run away from integration. Okay, integration is a headache. So how do I determine the potential energy value? This one, this mean? Okay, so This name, the idea here is, okay, you want to find, you want to find what is the work done by the gravity on cheese. Okay. Now, one way, your, your, our official definition is work equals integral of fx dx over the path, okay, if constant force 
then we say, okay, here's an easier version, f d cosine theta, right? Now, my d here, okay, is this. I'm tracing it with a red pen. Okay, my d isn't just a straight line. It's a long number. Even if we, even if the question already tells us, okay, if you trace this line, it's going to be two meters. Fine. But then what are these angles? This angle is different than this angle, different than this angle, different than this angle. You might say, okay, I'll just take the initial position and the final position. And this is my displacement. And I can find this angle somehow. Easy. Okay. Now you can do this. You can do the integration. You can integrate over your path. Or if they have already integrated it for you to be two meters, you can do the triangle. Okay. But and instead of doing all of this, because it, gravity is a conservative force, you can simply opt to choose the easiest path. And the easiest path is because it is a, it is a conservative force, it only depends on the final position and the initial position. Okay, so this is my final position. This is my initial position. And the difference between them in, in the x and the y axis is 0 0.8 meters. So I am simply going to be doing is M G 0 0.8 meters. And I am taking the straight line. So my angle is zero. Rather than taking the curved path, I have chosen to do the straight path. OK. Mariam, you can you can use it any time. That's the whole point of it. You choose what path you want to take. You choose the easy path. I could have chosen a million different paths here, but I chose this straight line because it is the easiest path for a conservative force. Okay? The straight line is always the easiest path, so I just chose it. How do I determine the potential values? Potential energy value. Well, we know the, potent the change in potential energy is equal to minus the work done. And we know work done is the integral of f of x dx from the initial position to the final position. So equating them, my potential energy is minus the integral of f of x dx. This is the general rule. OK. Hopefully, this will clarify it a bit further. A particle moves. Because it's in the same di same direction, uh, Rayan. Your your force, your gravity is this way, and your displacement is also this way. So they're parallel. There is no angle between them. It's zero. You're moving down. A particle moves from x equals d zero to x one. We don't know what x one is, due to a conservative force along the x-axis. The force has the same maximum magnitude F1 in all three situations. Rank the situations according to the change in the associated potential energy during the particle's motion. Most positive first. Think about it for a minute.
TBs, couple of A's. One C. So the correct answer is three, one, two. Why? It says rank the situations according to the change in the associated potential energy. Now this is a force position diagram. What, uh, what does the area under the force position diagram give us? It gives us work. We know work is equal to minus the change in potential energy, right? So in terms of area, biggest area equal areas, okay? They want the most positive first. Now, since the work here is negative. The change in, pos in potential energy is going to be negative, negative is positive. So delta U here is going to be positive. In the other two cases, the work is positive, which means the change in potential energy would be negative. Now, since this is smaller than this, this will be the most positive. Then this will be less negative and this will be more negative. If you want to look at it in numbers, say, for example, this area is equal to one, which means this area is equal to minus one and this is two when you do the negative okay this will become plus one this will become minus two this will become minus one so from most positive this is the order we're going to get so it will be three one, two. Three, one equals two. No, it's not going to be equal because the work done in two is more than the work done in one. So it's going to be more negative when you multiply it by minus. So work two is, for example, 10, while work one is equal to seven. When you do the negative, this will be minus 10, this will be minus seven. So they're not equal. One is still less negative than two. Okay. Gravitational potential energy, coming back to it. Because we're multiplying it by minus one. Remember, this is work. The area is work. Change in potential energy is minus work. This is what we have. Work, delta U. Work here is going to be positive. Work here is going to be positive. Work here is going to be negative. Delta U is here going to be negative, negative, positive. Numerical example. 
this might be for example oops seven ten minus seven so it become minus seven minus ten plus seven so in order it's going to be plus seven minus seven minus ten We have used MGH more than one time, but we have assumed F dot T. Let's do it again using integration, just to be safe, just to make sure that I haven't messed up the calculation somewhere. Delta U is minus work. Work is defined as integral of F of X, D of X. I am going to substitute F of X equals MG. If I take G downwards to be negative, it will become minus MG. I'm going to change the variable to DY because, well, my entire gravity works in Y, it doesn't work in X. And this is just a general rule. The minuses are going to cancel out. So I get MG out and integral of DY from the initial position to final position. Integral of DY is just Y from final to initial position, which means because I have taken G to be negative downwards. You can leave it positive, it's fine. Okay, so it means that MG, final position minus initial position, so MG delta Y, we have called it MGH. Okay. MGY, MGH, MGX, MGD, MGS, you can choose whatever letter you want. Okay. Okay. Now, this is because I have the minus here is because, oh, the minus here is because I have taken G to be negative in the downward direction. I can take G to be positive and switch the F and the I, and I will end up with exactly the same result anyway. And I'll show you how in a bit. Okay. So, Mariam, this is the interesting part for you. Gravitational potential energy of an object depends on its position with respect to a chosen reference level. Remember when in chapter three and chapter four, we're doing projectiles and there were so many questions. Okay, why is G negative? Why is G positive? When is it negative? When is it positive? And the conclusion we reached is you choose whether it is positive or negative. It is entirely up to you. Yes. Well, we come back to the same point here again when choosing what we call a reference level. Okay. So we choose where we want the potential energy to be zero. Why? Remember, we said W is equal to minus delta U. This delta kept showing up. We never said just U. We always talk about delta U. Change in U, not just U. OK, so yes, what I can do is I can choose u here to be 10 and which would mean that here it is 100 for example okay and then say uf minus ui is equal to 100 minus 10 equals 90 right or or just a crazy idea i can simply call this zero and then this will be 90 and then i don't have to subtract everything with relative to zero you don't need to subtract it's just 90 straight up Okay, I'll explain how in the next slide. Dependence of reference level on the potential energy. An object gains potential energy as it moves up. We have agreed to this, right? Now look what where my reference level is. This is my reference level. Okay, so I am going from I am going from y one to y two. 
So my U2 is more than my U1. This much I know. Okay. And delta U is going to be U2 minus U1, whatever numbers is. It also happens when you're going down, Maria. Okay. Now look what happens when I move my reference level. I'm moving my reference level level up. So I'm changing it. Okay, see? I'm moving it up. Now what did I do? I now said that y1 is equal to zero. Height is zero. Okay. I am starting to count all my heights from this point. So my potential energy of the object at reference level now is just zero. So my u2 will become just u2 minus u1. That's fine. u1 is zero, so just u2. Now here's what you were asking about, Maria. What, what about when I take my reference level between the two balls, between y1 and y2? Now it's going to be a bit funny, but it's still going to work. Okay, now the potential energy is positive if the object is above the reference level, but negative if it is below the reference level. So, if I am trying to take, okay, the difference between them, now I will have U2 minus, minus U1, which is equal to U2 plus U1. Let me put in some numbers to make it clear. Okay. When this was my zero point, this was 10 and this was 20. Okay, fine. So when this was my reference level, uh, so my, when my reference level was down, my delta U was equal to 20 minus 10, which is equal to 10, right? When I brought my reference level to here, this became zero and this became 10. So my delta U is still equal to 10. When I brought my reference level here, okay, this became minus 5 and this became plus 5. So my delta U became 5 minus minus 5, which is still equal to 10. How do I choose a reference level? Based on what? Okay. Let's look at it again. My reference level now is on the floor. Okay. The book 1 it's put a gravitational potential energy is what? MGH, H is one meter, so it's just simply MG1. What about the second book? It's at two meters from the first book, so total height three meters from my first, from my reference level. So it is MG3. Final potential energy of the book, MG3, yes? Let me move my reference level now to the table level. My ground level now is mg minus 1. And up there is mg2. So my final potential energy of the book now is mg2. Which one of them is correct? Which one of these two is correct? Some A, some B's, a both. So the correct answer is both. Both of them are correct. Okay. Because the change in potential energy is important. Remember what I said in the previous slide? A couple of slides ago. We said we look at the change in potential energy, not the potential energy itself. 
Okay, so it's the change in potential energy that is important. When the ground is at reference level, mg3 minus mg1 is equal to mg2. So the change is 2mg, right? When the table is the reference level, I do the same calculation. My potential numbers are different, but my change is still exactly the same, 2mg. So both of them are correct. So we choose it usually to make our lives easier. Simple as that. What about elastic potential energy? Here's another type of potential energy. We spoke about this in the previous lecture. We have an object. This is my x equals to 0. So notice that I have put my x equal to 0 at a weird position. Have you noticed that? You, in the previous time, I said this is x equals to 0. This time, I put it in the middle of the spring. I pull it back. This is xf. My force is minus kx. And it's a conservative force because the work done by the spring is independent of the path. OK, I'm not going to prove that it's independent. I'm just going to tell you it's independent and that it's a conservative path. So the change in elastic potential energy is equal to minus the work done by the elastic. Work done by the elastic is half kxf squared minus half kxi squared from the previous lecture. And delta u is equal to half kxf squared minus half kxi squared. OK, let me see. If at xi equals 0, the EPE is simply 0. So I simply end up with the elastic potential energy equal to half kx squared. Now, here is the important part. OK, you choose your x equals to 0, and you measure everything from here. This is your reference point. Just like with gravity, we decide the reference point in springs. This is what we call the reference point. So if this is my x equals to 0, and I want to measure the distances here and here, I will measure it from here to here and from here to here. On the other hand, if I choose this to be x equals to 0, then what I am going to do is, for the same distances, I am going to be taking this and this distance. OK, the important bit is when I subtract one from the other, it doesn't matter if I chose reference point one or reference point two, I will still get the same number. Okay, not many more. Almost done with the slides for today. So. Let's speak about a bit about conservation of energy, which is something that we have already actually spoken about a couple of times, but we want to talk about it now. So just to avoid confusions. Now it says the right number. Okay. okay. So what is the total energy of a system if we have something moving? We have potential energy. We have mechanical energy, right? 
So the total mechanical energy of a system is its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. Now let's assume that the system is isolated from its environment. That is no external force from an object outside the system causes any energy changes inside the system. Okay, it's isolated somehow. From before, okay, we know that delta, we said that the change in kinetic energy equals work. Then at, at some other point, we said change in potential energy equals minus work. Okay, now let's bring them both together. If we assume these two are correct, okay, then delta K is equal to minus delta U. I'm going to bring them both to the same direction, to the same side. K2 minus K1 equals minus U2 minus U1. I'm just going to expand it because I'm bored. Which means that K2 plus U2, now I'm going to bring them, I'm going to bring all the twos on one side, all the ones on one side. K2 plus U2 equals K1 plus U1. What does this mean? Now, this is something that you have probably studied back in school days and you know it, but you just don't know it in this equation format. Okay. Energy is conserved. It can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. Okay. Now, this is not a full version. Yeah. Yes. But this is not even the full, full version. Later on, we're going to expand on this, but I am going to write even more to this. The total energy is fixed. Okay, so say, for example, you have extra energies, more than kinetic and you. You might have kinetic, you might have you, you might have uh, friction, you might have tension energy, you might have a whole bunch of other energies, okay? Energy before is equal to energy after. It needs to go somewhere. Okay. So, principle of conservation of mechanical energy is this. That the net change in kinetic and en in energy needs to be zero. So by now you have all done this lab. You might have already noticed this in the lab, but if not, then I would like to show you. So I'll do something. I'll keep it on Earth. And we asked you in the lab, this is the lab, lab. This is the lab that you were doing. Okay. We asked you to put damping at zero. Remember the slider? We asked you to put damping at zero. And now I'll tell you why. Okay. I'll keep the spring constant at about this. Okay. I'm gonna add the mass to make it about 165 is fine. Now take a look at the left side where it says energy graph, okay? There is kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, potential energy elastic, and E thermal. And we have E total. Now notice this. My E total is fixed, okay? The amount of energy, depending on the position, okay, is set, is shared between the kinetic energy. Let me make it slow so that we can actually see it. See, as the kinetic energy, kinetic energy increases, potential energy increases, elastic decreases. Now we're pulling it, elastic increases, kinetic decreases, gravitational decreases. Okay, thermal energy is zero. Yes, now I am going to add some damping. It didn't really make a difference for you in the lab, by the way. If you have not set damping to zero, it will not make a it, it will not make a fuss because we were not looking at the movement, just at the positions. 
Okay. Now see what happens when I add a tiny bit of damping. Okay. I'm going to just bring it one. See what happens. My total energy is still the same, but as it is moving, there is friction. Yeah. See, there's friction working, and every time there is movement, friction is causing some of the energy to be taken away and wasted as heat. And because we said friction is non-conservative, we cannot take it back. Look what happens. The kinetic energy becomes much, much slower, much, much slower, much, much slower, up until a point where... I'm going to make it stop now. Okay, up until a point where your total energy is still the same, but it stopped moving. It stopped moving because it has potential gravitational potential energy, okay, and it has elastic potential energy because of the spring, and all the rest of the energy was wasted as thermal energy in friction and heat. So it doesn't have any more energy to make movement. Okay, now what I'm going to do is if I increase the thermal coefficient, and I'm going to make this, oops, okay. I'm going to put this, which was the heaviest one, I think. Yes, and let's see what happens. The same thing happens, okay? So the total energy is the same, okay? We can do the same using a simple pendulum, but I'm not gonna do it. Uh, it's nine past one. Mm. You know what? Let's actually do the second one. Al Anud, I know I said I'm going to send an email. I don't know yet because there was a meeting of the examination committee uh, yesterday. I am waiting for their minutes of meeting to get back to you. Okay, so give, I'll, I'll call them after this lecture and hopefully they will be able to tell me what the guidance, formal guidance is. Okay. All right. All right. So this is a simple pendulum. We will learn about simple pendulums later in this course. OK. But the idea is very much like the spring, which keeps going up and down. OK. But now we will have an angle. OK. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the mass to one kilogram, the length to 0 0.7 meters, gravity to earth, and I will take friction away. And I am going to do this. It's like these old clocks, you see, tick tock, tick tock. And See, your total energy is between kinetic energy and potential energy. Okay, potential energy in this case is gravitational potential energy. You don't have elas elastic uh, energy. Okay. No elastic energy here. Gravitational because there's nothing elastic. And your total is the same. Now, when I introduce friction, every time it's moving, you're losing a bit of energy to friction. And although most people, and this is actually quite important, most people think that things stop when all the energy is gone, when you end up with zero energy, okay? This is not quite true, okay? See, in the case of a pendulum, this is true, okay? See, in the case of a pendulum, this is true. Movement stops when you have all of your energy goes away to thermal energy. But in the spring, this was not the case. 
I don't know if you remember or not. Yeah. See, in the spring, this is not the case. In the spring, only when half the energy is gone as thermal energy, movement goes away. Because you still have potential energy and elastic potential energy. So it's not a rule that always all of the energy needs to go away. In some cases, like the pendulum, yes, all the energy needs to go away. In other cases, it's enough for half the energy to go away and half of it to be used elsewhere. Okay, think of it like money. You might have zero reals in your pocket because you give all 100 reals to one person, or you might have zero reals in your pocket because you gave 10 reals to 10 people, so the total was 100. Either way, you are broke, you don't have money in your pocket, but the reasons are slightly different. Okay? All right, so... Mashal tikun fin nos, fil zimbark, but in the pendulum, yes, it will always go to zero because you have nothing. Okay, you don't have anything elastic. But for the spring, it might be half, it might be less than half. Let's actually, you know what? Let's do an experiment. Let's look at this. Let's look at it. I'm going to put this. See, when I have a little bit of damping, Look what happened. Not even third. Tiny, tiny bit. Small mass. <laughs> Small mass. Tiny bit of it went away. That's it, gone. Let me do the same small mass, but with lots of damping. Pretty much the same. Okay, let me do something. I'm going to pull it so that I have a lot of um, energy. Interesting. This time, it's more than half the energy went to thermal energy. So what is happening is, exactly like the money example, okay, you have a hundred of it, okay? And basically you are looking for a way to distribute this energy in different, different ways, okay? Now, what happens is it stops moving when the component of not only on damping. See, I'll keep damping on lots, okay? I'm not going to change anything except how much I pull the spring, okay? Look, this time I'm going to pull the spring a tiny bit, okay? Only a tiny bit. Let me bring a ruler to be scientific about this. Okay, look, this time I'm only going to be pulling it about 15 centimeters. It immediately stopped. Yeah, only a tiny bit of thermal. Now I'm going to pull it until 40. About a quarter is thermal. I'm going to pull it under 60. About a half is thermal. I'm going to pull it all the way here, almost two thirds is thermal, okay? So what happens is you have a total energy of 100 and it is being distributed among different, different components. Movement stops when the component of kinetic is zero. This is always true because if you don't have kinetic energy, you don't have movement, but where did the energy go? differs. For example, when I pull it only a little bit, okay, just a tiny, tiny bit, what happens is I already, I only had a tiny bit of kinetic energy. So all of that went to thermal. My potent, my elastic and gravitational are still there. If I pull it a lot, look what happens before I leave it. Yeah. Ah, this is actually interesting. Look, can you see this uh, zero here? Height equals zero meters at the bottom. This is where we're taking our zero, our reference point, zero for gravity. Now look at this. I am The more I pull it, 
the less gravitational energy I have and the more elastic energy I have. Can you see it? So by now, most of my energy is initially elastic and a bit is gravitational. And if I go even more, look, my total energy is even more and my gravitational energy is negative. But that is fine because my total energy is going to be plus minus minus. So they're going to add up. Okay. Now what happens is when I have pulled it this much, I have given it a lot of elastic potential energy. And when I release it, it will try to give it all to kinetic energy, but I have a lot of friction. So in the process, I am going to lose, I'm going to reduce the damping just so that this is slower. Okay. Every time it is moving, it's going to lose a little bit of thermal energy. Okay. And it's going to, while it's going up, its potential energy, its gravitational GPE is going to increase and EPE is going to decrease because the spring is being less and less stretched. Look at it. I'm going to redo it. Look at it now. Every time it's moving, the thermal increases, the gravitational and potential and the elastic are trying to jockey for power whichever is first. And at the very end, you will end up with some balance. Okay, so it's not as easy as saying it always needs to be zero or this, but it's always when the kinetic energy finishes. Where it goes, there are a lot of variables here. So in, in, in such a simple system, you already saw so many variables. Because here you have two types of potential energy. In the pendulum, you don't have, you only have one type of potential energy. Okay, so it's rather simple. You start with only potential gravitational potential energy and you start with only gravitational potential energy and it all goes to kinetic. Kinetic potential, kinetic potential, kinetic potential. When you introduce friction, it will start losing some of them to thermal up until the point where you're no longer having any kinetic energy. OK. All right, so that's going to be all for today.